the bottom, meaning I do not touch the top half. That belongs to the guest. The reason being, the last thing you want to see is somebody, and if you're ever in a restaurant and the server brings your glass like this, get a new glass. They just touched where you're going to put your lips. Gross. Even that's too high. We touch the stem. Well, similar thing to the bottle. You do not want to bring the bottle out like this. Because you know what you're doing? You're touching, even with this foil on it, you don't want them thinking that your meaty hands have been on that top. So if you are going to carry it by the neck, try and get it as low as possible. Leave that guest end. Um, but a lot of times you'll be carrying it um, by the actual body. Um, a lot of red wines actually have the, the dimple or the dent. Um, it's a bit of a number of reasons, sediment, mm. things like that. Anyway, it, off, it actually offers you a bit of a handle for pouring. Um, so the red wine bottles are great for holding on uh, because when you do pour, uh, it is a one-handed pour. Two hands, uh, you might have to at first to steady yourself, but eventually you want to get in the habit of being able to pour yourself uh, or pour glasses single-handed. Anyway, back, I'm getting distracted. Back to the, so yeah, we don't touch up here if we are going to hold it by the neck, because sometimes we have to, we're going to hold it as low as possible. And again, whenever we're doing things with a bottle of wine, we're always keeping that label faced to the guest. We never want to kind of start to do this or anything. We're not going to hide the bottle. We're always displaying that label at all times. Okay, so we've gotten our affirmative. We have extracted our corkscrew out of our apron or whatever, and now we have to cut the foil. So if you can see, there's a foil on this. Perfect. There's a foil on this. Um, some foils are just plastic. Other foils are actually a, a light lead um, or, or thicker. So it does require a sharp knife. Um, so the little knife or the cutter that's on your corkscrew should be fairly sharp. Um, and the best ones are actually, they're serrated. Uh, they get a nice cut because some of these foils, especially with the older, more expensive wines, these foils can actually be quite thick. Okay, so we've gotten our affirmative. We're gonna grasp, grasp down as far as we can, leave that uh, guest end at the top. And there's always a little ridge kind of right under the top of the, the, uh, the cork. That's a great place to put that knife. Because what we're gonna do is we're gonna do a, about a 270 degree cut. And again, we are not gonna rotate the bottle. We're gonna rotate our opener. Okay, so I'll make off my first cut. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually place that knife right at about, nine nine o'clock and then i'm going to slide it all the way around making about a 270 degree cut now again i haven't turned the bottle i've turned my corkscrew now there's a slit in there all i have to do is place that knife in that slit and pull it up okay so now the foil has been compromised i can put my knife down so i don't poke anyone or myself and then i'm simply going to finish that tear off and get the foil off now that little bit of scrap foil discreetly as possible goes into your pocket or your apron pocket. Um, and the one nice thing, um, make sure you get a nice cut so that none of the foil is over the bottle because you don't want that foil to interfere with the pour. Okay, the foil is cut. We've exposed our cork. Next step, so the knife is in. And this is why I talked about last week about getting these things to be a little uh, looser. If they're very stiff, because again, I am holding this bottle in one hand. I have to be able to open my corkscrew with one hand. Because you don't want to be fumbling. You want to be very casual with this. And I've got my corkscrew open. And again, I'm not, uh, I'm going to show you this. So I wouldn't be doing this to the guest. But at the top of the cork, the corkscrew has a very sharp point. You want that point to end up right in the middle of the cork. Um, and you want to be able to do it vertically. So the easiest way to do this is to actually pierce the center of the cork and kind of give it a little half twist at the same time. And then you'll end up with the corkscrew, hopefully vertically in the cork. If it is not vertical and you start screwing it in, obviously it's going to screw it in an angle and start to hit the glass. That might puncture the side of the cork, get some cork residue to fall into the to the to the bottle worst case scenario it might even crack the glass of the of the bottle so try very carefully to once you get that corkscrew started to be getting it going vertically straight down and we're going to just twist obviously the corkscrew is disappearing into the bottle 
Now, your question might be, when do you stop? Well, you stop with about one rotation of the cork left in there. The reason being, if your cork, if you keep screwing right till that corkscrew disappears, the bottom of the corkscrew will actually come out the bottom of the cork. And again, that will crack or break the cork. Cork will fall into the wine. Wine will get poured into the glass, into the consumer's mouth. They're not happy. So we stop with about one row, one time left. Now this is the beauty of the double hinged cork. We have two ratchets. So I'm gonna put it on the first one. And again, I'm gonna show you this bottle here. I'm gonna hook that first bit of tooth onto the top of the bottle. So the first tooth is now on that bottle. And sometimes if the cork is a little stiff, you might actually have to put a little bit of pressure with your finger just to hold that tooth in there. And then with leverage, I'm just gonna pull straight up as far as it goes. So that's as far as the first ratchet will take me. The cork is now about half extracted. So now all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna engage the second tooth. The second tooth is farther down at the top of the, uh, the, top of the hinge. And again, straight up, we get a little pop. You don't have to have a big loud pop. In fact, a gentle pop is nice. Okay, so here comes the trickier part. We have the bottle in one hand, cork and corkscrew in the other, I need to give the cork to the host or hostess, but I can't put my bottle down yet. So there are a few ways to do it. You can nestle the bottle in your arm like this, pinch the cork and extract the corkscrew. Another way would be to use the neck, extract your cork this way or this way. The one thing is the bottom of the cork is what's gonna contain the aroma that the guest, um, or sorry, the, um, the moisture content. The guest wants to see that the cork is not dry and cracked. So again, we're gonna take our corkscrew out. Once that is out, corkscrew can go back into the apron. It's gone, it's done, it's duty has been served. We're gonna leave the cork for the guest. Here, let's get me back into the picture here. So we're gonna leave the cork for the guest. Now, a lot of people, especially if they've watched old movies, they'll pick the cork up and smell it. That's not really what's going on here. What, what they wanna do is inspect, maybe even squeeze it to see if that cork is dried out and cracked or if it's still moist at the end, um, as it should be. So most wine experts, you can tell a real wine expert, they won't smell it, they will just squeeze it, give it a look. Nod the affirmative. If this was cracked, you might say, oh no, the cork is ruined, get me another bottle. It's not, it's good. It simply gets placed in front of the host or hostess on the table. Now, in a discreet method, say, I'd like to pour a sample for you, or would you please sample the wine for me? So I have a wine glass here. Let's get this down a little bit lower here so you can see the wine glass. Now again, um, this is why we have our napkin. If we happen to drip, if some wine spills on the table or if it drips down the bottle, that's okay, discreetly as possible. You know, we're here to, we have a little um, linen to give it a wipe. Um, to keep things fresh. But when we're pouring, now a sample is just a sample. It's less than an, an ounce or less. It's just enough to swirl and swish in the mouth. Um, so again, tilting the bottle down. And this is what my students, they struggle a lot with sometimes when the first time you try this, um, to, to, to pour correctly. You, you don't want to timidly pour. You actually, you know, get above the glass. And again, let me lower this down here. You want to get above the glass so you can lower the glass the um, bottle to the glass and just let a little turn out the last thing is that twist at the end that'll catch any of the drips so again we got a nice pour no drips if we did a little quick uh, quick wipe the guest now we've only got a little bit that's how much i poured in there enough for him to swirl smell oh that does smell good it's a little early in the morning for wine so i'm not actually going to taste it mm, it's a nice wine now the host or hostess will taste the wine, nod the affirmative, yep, that's fine. And then the final step is to go around and serve everyone else first. The last person to get a full glass of wine would be the host or hostess. Now, traditionally, again, a lot of this wine uh, knowledge does go back a little ways, so there are some old fashioned ideas, but basically you want to serve the oldest woman to the youngest woman, then the oldest man, to the youngest man, and finally finish with the host or hostess. Now you say, Blair, well, what about it? What if the host or hostess is a woman? 
Do we start with her? No, you still end with the host or hostess. It could be the one woman hostess ordering the bottle of wine with three men. Serve all three men in order of oldest to youngest, and then finally the host. Obviously, if there was women guests, you would serve the women first, then the men, then the host. And depending on your establishment's pores, most places four or five ounces, or for five or six ounces at most. So in a glass like this, this is a Rydell, um, four or five ounces is only going to be, it's not even going to be halfway up. A lot of, the, don't think that you have to pour a wine glass way up here. Four or five ounces, six ounces, depending on what your establishment serves, is going to not even fill halfway. Um, but that is intentional. We have a lot of room for that bouquet to swirl around for us to get the wine up in the sides and see the legs um, and to bring in some oxygen. Mm, maybe tonight. Uh, so yeah, once everyone has been served, hostess last, then and only then can you finally place the bottle of wine on the table. And depending on what your establishment does, some places, and again, let me lower you down here, will take the napkin and actually leave it on the bottle. So time out here, let me just get the bottle, pretend this bottle's on the table so you can see the neck and actually leave the napkin on the bottle um, by doing uh, what's called a collar fold or an apron fold. That way when the host or hostess pours, there's that nice linen there to catch. Not all places do that and it's completely up to your manager or whoever has hired you. You might just uh, take that apron back with you or that um, napkin back with you. So a couple of key points on the opening of the wine. One, always keeping that label facing the host or hostess when you're doing things. Uh, two, not just automatically going through these things, but actually listening to the answers. Um, so when you come up with that wine uh, and give the vineyard or where that wine was grown, the vintage, again, the year that the grape was harvested, and then finally the varietal of the grape. If it's a blend, you might have a name for it. Your, our Cab Merlot from Dynamite Vineyards 2018. Give them all three of those bits of information. Uh, once it's been uh, confirmed that that's the bottle, Again, label facing the guest, knife out. We try to be subtle, discreet, not big actions. It's almost like you're invisible doing this, but of course, a lot of people don't get wine open for them very often. So some tables won't even watch you. They'll just be in their own conversation. Other table will just focus right on you. It's like a little show. Um, and those are the nerve wracking ones. But once you do it a few times, it actually gets to be kind of fun. And it's a great way, once you get comfortable, to interact with your guests. You know, you can be, oh, so what brought you in tonight? And da, 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 while you talk. But only if you can talk and open a bottle of wine at the same time. Once it's open, we pour the host or hostess a small sample. You know, just like um, not even an ounce, enough for them to smell and, and taste. Once it's uh, confirmed, then we go oldest woman to youngest woman, oldest man to youngest man finally ending with the host or hostess. Once they're poured, bottle hits the table. Now, uh, for something slightly different, if you're lucky to work in a place that sells sparkling wine or champagne and buy the bottle that you get to open, it's a little different. Champagne, of course, has got carbon dioxide, it's pressurized, and the cork, if you've ever seen a champagne cork, it will leave the bottle at a high rate of speed. Very dangerous. Um, and yes, when I was 19 years old in my first serving position, I hit a lady in the throat with a champagne cork. I did not get a very good tip on that table. It was a momentary lapse. It, all it took was a second. Uh, yeah, that was not good. So I'm going to open this. This is a sparkling uh, wine. Obviously, it is not from Champagne region in France. I cannot call it Champagne. I call it sparkling wine. Um, and it's a very, it's just a La Scala Spamante. It's a, it's a basic wine. I don't know what I do with my corkscrew. All right, put it in my apron. So you still need a corkscrew for a um, bottle of sparkling wine. Why? Because there is foil over the cage. Some, not all, but some sparkling wines will actually have a tab in their foil to open and, and to open the foil. This one does not. This is strictly all foil. So all I have to do is take my cutter, once again, same thing, same rules apply, you wanna keep it in one hand. Cutter out. Now the nice thing on these things, underneath this foil is a wire cage. 
So the cage has a tab, um, and this is gonna be hard for you guys to see, but the tab is actually right there and it lifts the foil out a little bit. It's a great place to get your knife under. See that, I just put it right under there. There's the tab, but it easily cuts the foil. Once you have the foil cut, you can then simply peel it off. Oops. You want to separate that foil. The foil, this is an old one. The foil tab comes off again discreetly into your apron pocket, not on the table. So now this is a wire cage over a plastic uh, champagne or sparkling wine cork. So now the corkscrew can go away. We don't need it anymore. And you're going to actually lift that tab up and you just back out the screw or unscrew it. And off comes the wire cage again, discreetly into your pocket or apron. Now here's the tricky part. This is under pressure. Some champagne will actually almost start to come out once that wire cage is off because the pressure has been building. We want to catch that cork. We don't want it to go into the neck of a lady or the head of a gentleman. So again, we're going to use our apron again. Now, here is the key point. We're going to put the apron over the cork and we're going to have it at about a 45 degree angle. And then we're simply going to grab that cork and we're going to twist. We're going to hold the bottle and we're going to twist the cork. And as soon as you start to twist it, it's going to start working itself out. You're going to catch it in your hand, but at a 45 degree angle, here it comes, here it comes. There it goes. I've caught it in my hand. We have champagne, or sorry, sparkling wine. Um, if this was a cork, a synthetic or natural cork, I would leave it on the table. Uh, plastic ones, there's nothing to feel or smell that can go on your apron again discreetly. I happen to have a champagne flute with me here. So we will, um, again, sparkling wine, um, typically you do not serve a sample. It is what it is. You can simply start with the oldest woman to the youngest woman and start giving a pour. Let's get a bit more here. So in a champagne flute, we get that nice oxygenation in the bubbles. Um, so you can see them start to rise already. This uh, I'm not going to sample because it is very cheap sparkling wine. I just wanted you sh to show you how to catch a sparkling wine cork. Um, if you're in an outdoor situation and the guests, sometimes they'll actually request you to shoot the cork out, make sure you're pointing that cork somewhere safe, not where it can ricochet. Um, and at a 45 degree angle, that keeps, if you were to do it straight up, you will lose some sparkling wine, it's gonna spill out. Um, 45 degree angle will keep that gas escaping without the liquid escaping. All right, opened. So I've done it. It's going to be your turn. Um, so for those of you that are uh, up on Moodle quickly, this morning I opened up the next Moodle portal, which would be the wine. Uh, there's two wine quizzes and there are some assignments.